season. Uh, next Sunday, uh, we'll be having the Christmas cantata, and I hope that many people possibly can come. We do have a couple more announcements. Morning. Morning. Um, if you look at the screen, um, this is a flyer that we have made for our upcoming youth service on January 1st. We're going to start posting them around town. Um, and we wanted to show them to y'all, encourage y'all to start inviting some of the young people to come out. I know that it is a holiday and all, but um, what better way to start the year than to have a time worshiping our Lord who's been great to us this year, right? Um, also, this Wednesday, our youth group is going to have our um, Grinchmas. So we're having a little Christmas party for the youth group that will start at 6 o'clock and it will go until church is over. Um, please invite, please come out and enjoy it. And also we will have drama practice today um, at 3.30. Thank you. I know you'll probably get tired of me coming up, but we're really excited next Wednesday. We're going to have Happy Birthday to Jesus party. And it's going to be a party. We're going to have a devotion. We're going to sing some carols. We're going to have cake and ice cream. And we are also going to bring Jesus presents. And the presents we're going to bring him are in the form of food for our food bank. And if you've been watching, the needs have been posted. And if you don't want to do that, you can make a monetary donation. We're going to use it towards <coughs> our, our, church's, um, our church's own outreach programs. So um, we're really excited about this time. What better way to honor Christ than getting together with fellow Christians, enjoying his word, his song, and remembering that he's the best gift we got and that we can give back to others and share that love of Christ that he's so generously given to us. So we look forward to seeing you. This is a happy time of year, and I'm glad that we can celebrate the happiness of this year and also share that joy with others because joy that we keep to ourselves is not joy that is used properly. It is better to give our joy than to expect everyone to, to cause us to have joy. So we, we will honor that, and I appreciate the Children's Department um, sharing that. We've got just a lot of good things. Next Sunday will be our cantata, so a lot of good singing next next week coming. And this will be the Wednesday before Christmas is our uh, happy birthday party to Jesus. So, I mean, it's just a wonderful, a wonderful time of the year. We will, of course, have service on Christmas Day. Uh, as well, so there's a lot of opportunities just to enjoy the season with each other. We don't want to add stuff to your holidays. I know it's already busy, but we truly want these times to be restful, both mind, body, and spirit. So I pray that you can um, you can take advantage of those as, as best as you can. And I, I also need to say praise the Lord this morning. Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. God is good. <clears throat> Let's stand together. We want to sing the Christmas. Carol and him. It's 1001 in your book if you need it, but the words will be on the screen. Mark the Herald Angel sing. Glory to the new Lord King.
family, in your house, as gathered together as your people under your Godhead, to serve and to honor you, to worship you, to lift one another up as you have called us to do. I pray that your will and that your way be done and had in each and every request that was mentioned in those that weren't. That we remove ourselves and what we may be desiring out of these outcomes, that we look for you and what you have for these outcomes. As we come together, let us remove ourselves and let your Holy Spirit have its will and have its way in, our, in this place and in our lives. Not just today, but throughout our lives. This week, time to come to remember one another. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
remember I mentioned about the angel speaking to you. Mary, the angel speaking to Joseph. Amen. Mary said yes. Joseph said yes. I can't help but think this morning we need to say yes. You see, there are people that are hurting and they don't know why. Jesus said we will suffer, we will suffer, but we as Christians, we need to live above all that. And we'll surrender to God this morning. Every need that we have, God will take care of it. He already has a plan. How many, how many understand and believe that this morning? God already has a plan, he knows everything. So as I say yes to the Lord this morning, I'll say yes, it's simple. What we've got to do this morning. We've got a man to be confessed to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. as well. 
Not at all. He works and he does in us for his good pleasure. Whose good pleasure? His good pleasure, not ours. So now do all things without complaining and disputing. The altars are open. <laughs> without complaining and disputing. Hmm. That you may be blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Oh God, thank you that you've reminded us of the great gift that we have. Father, we sing, we just heard the song, Mary did Mary know? She had some inkling, but she would learn very well. Who she really had in her life was not simply her offspring. It was her Savior. It was the very Son of God. So, Father, let us, like her, be more aware of the gift that we have in you. More than we ever have been. Let this not be a rehearsal of the past, but fresh and new. May we give thanks to God for Jesus Christ, who is resident in our souls by the Holy Spirit, and that we have truth. That we have light because we have you. So, Father, bless your people whom you so dearly love today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to talk to you about a crooked and perverse generation. This was a generation of the 1500s. Maybe you'll find some similarities with your own. The politics of that day was more universal than it was today. The government was all-powerful all over Europe. It had been involved in war, and so it seemed like that the leaders were more interested in politics than in piety. More interested in politics than doing what is right. The government had a way of canceling you if you did not do exactly what it said you ought to do. It indoctrinated from birth all its residents by telling them that we have provided in your local communities a ticket to heaven, a passport to heaven. And so you must avail yourself of that government-endorsed official so that you may be able to make it to heaven. Scripture was not accessible unless you knew the government's official language. You had to make it on your own. And if you didn't do everything correctly, well, there was always the universal way to get into heaven. Money. <laughs> Buy your way into heaven. Buy your way into good counsel. If you, if, uh, and this is how they, they raised money in that day. Wealthy families, they bought their way into the priesthood, and then they bought their way into heaven. A peasant had to give up everything, all of their worldly belongings, to, to go into that. Families were expected to pay for their child's christening. That's basically when your child got dedicated, pony up some money because we don't do that for free. You had to pay to bury a loved one in sacred ground or we could throw them in with the thieves and the robbers and you know where they go. You also had to pay to get married. You had to pay a tithe to the church. Forced payment to tithe. And you had a certain amount of days that you had to work at the church for a week. It was required of you. Heretics who spoke against the powers of the government, well, they were just set up and burned on the streetways. John Huss, one of our great reformers, was killed in such a way. A man of God who sought to, to worship God was tied to a stake. The stake was lit and he burned to death while everybody around him watched. Not a happy time. Very corrupt time in the 1500s. Relics were the objects, I guess you could say they were the they were the, the, the TikTok of that day. You gotta see what's going on. You gotta see what's happening. So there's plenty of relics to go visit. That's that's something that was left behind from a saint. It could be a piece of straw that the donkey that carried Jesus walked upon one day 
And now you get to see the straw that was under the donkey's hoof that held Jesus. So it's a sacred relic. By the way, you got to pay to see it. If you didn't see it, then you wanted to own it. So you had to pay money to own those precious relics. Indulgences were also paid. The church was involved in this. If you wanted to get your poor husband because he was such a drunkard and a worthless man, pay some money. The more you pay, the quicker he gets out of purgatory and the sooner he gets into the bliss of heaven. Sounds very different, doesn't it? But sounds very corrupt. If you went on a crusade, in other words, put your life on the line fighting the wars we want you to fight, well, that's an easy ticket to heaven. I've heard that kind of, that kind of idea before. <coughs> Pilgrimages were always taken out of religious devotion, but if you wanted to say that you actually didn't get credit for it, you guessed it. you got to pay for some relic to bring back to prove that you did what you did. The sad part about the government in the 1500s is they merged with the church. The church and the government were one. So please be careful if you pray for another church, state, government in control. We've done that. It was an ugly thing. Not because Christ makes it ugly. Because sometimes people, no, all the times people are sinners. And just because they were Christ doesn't make them any less sinner. Only His blood and repentance brings that. So, crooked and perverse. We can look at that. We can look at that past generation. Can't we agree with that? That's crooked and that's perverse. Now, is money a big deal today? Oh, can money get you a lot of things today? Can, can, if you do everything right and do exactly what the, what the powers that be says, can't that get you benefits that others cannot get? Yes, so the corruption that was then has certainly not dissipated from now. But sometimes I think we have to step out of the midst of our own culture and understand there has never been a generation, including in Paul's day, where the culture at large was not crooked and it was not perverse. It was bent. And what is it bent by? What is it crooked compared to? What is it perverse? compared to compared to the truth of God compared to the administration of God compared to God's will that's why Paul started this whole section is God is working in you he's not working you to complain about everything he's not working in you to grumble about the state of the world he's working in you to accomplish his will in you and can I tell you if God can get his will done in everybody then he's already king He's already ruling. He's already Lord of this world, but we have not seen that yet because His will is not done on earth as it is in heaven. Not yet, at least. So anything that falls short of that is crooked and it's perverse. Now some people still love our culture and I love our country. I, I love the culture as I know it of, but it's important for us as Christian believers to understand where we've gone wrong. To understand what is crooked. To understand what's perverse. A lot of words are thrown out today without meaning. But when Paul says crooked and perverse, what he means is anything less than God's standard is crooked and perverse. I have many illustrations that I could use, but the Surgeon General of this very powerful country is a great Surgeon General because it can help both men and women because he's been both. He's currently a woman. But he was born a man. That is the most powerful medical administrator in this country of the most powerful nation on the earth. One department, one person. But even in that, you can see all over this country, all over not only government, but all over our communities, all over sometimes our own households, things are crooked and things are even perverse. They are opposite of what God wants it to be. And we think our solution is. I listen to the culture. The solution is less God, more me. It's not working. It's not working. We're just becoming more crooked. And we're becoming more perverse compared to the standard of Jesus Christ. The only ones that ever complain about Jesus is, is the sinners that are talking about Christians not acting like him. But are they acting like him? No. So it's really easy to criticize another group of people. It's easy to grumble and complain. That's the way of the world.
That's not the way of Christ. Christ grew up under Roman authority and a Jewish council that will eventually take his life. Name me one political sermon or one thing says we need to overthrow the powers that be. He hung out with the lepers. He hung out with the prostitutes. He hung out even not with the religious people. He hung out with the sinner of the sinners. That will never work. Except it did. So maybe he's not crooked and perverse. Maybe we're crooked and perverse still. And maybe Christ still has some work to do on us. Crooked and perverse is the generation. Unless we understand that, we won't understand what's going wrong in our world at all. But Paul, let me quickly say, Paul says, I want you to do something about it. I don't want you to be crooked. I don't want you to be perverse. He says, I want judgment to begin in the house of God. I don't want sinners to become saints more than I want those who already know me to grow in my character. Because the gospel should be shared by everybody. But you can't expect a sinner to act like Christ when they don't even know Him. I know Him. You know Him. Where's His character? Where is the solution being worked out in you? This is what Paul is saying. So the first thing he says, once you see the crooked and perverse generation, quit complaining about it. I see, I see the social media. We complain about a lot. That old government, that old election, those old people. What does it accomplish? No. Do people get insight? Do they learn? You know what? That's a really interesting point. I think I'm going to change my ways. No. It's like we're doing something that doesn't work. But can I tell you, 2,000 years ago, Paul said, this is not the way that you work it. I could rail against Nero. I could rail against the Senate. I could rail against the Jewish authorities. But I've got too much work talking and living for my Jesus to talk about politics. I'm doing a higher calling. I don't have time for a lesser calling. So what do we do? What is the answer? How about you become blameless and harmless? Blameless and harmless. So I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to work on me. Well, that's his solution. That's what he did. He didn't send a revival preacher 2,000 years ago. He sent a Savior. Amen. He sent someone to save us and to take us from darkness to light. So the person made the difference, not an organization, not anything. I mean, you can even say the disciples were the closest thing he got to an organization. They were messed up, and it was only by his personal authority that they became who they were. So I think it's not so distant for us to think, who is the answer to this world? You are. I am. What position do I need to run for? None, unless God calls you to. This is God's calling. It's not my call. God's calling you to be who He wants you to be. That is the answer. And that's an answer we need across the board, church and outside the church. Because if everybody would get off of social media and take care of their own selves better than they are, then we could all get along a little better. But we're too busy talking about, you're the problem, you're the problem, you're the problem. Everybody's pointing fingers at everybody and nothing is being accomplished. And our representatives are doing the same. They don't even try. You don't hear, I am going to serve all Americans anymore, do you? Because they don't. They serve their side. And then when the other side gets it, I serve my side. And so this one complains for four years while this one is happy for four years. And then the opposite is true in the next four years. This is not the work of the church. It is a work for us to have to consider as citizens of this country. But the church is the calling of God. And he says, number one, I want you harmless and blameless. As I was growing up in the church, I didn't know a lot about politics. But I knew a whole lot of elders that said, you need to be in the altar. You need to be seeking God. You need to seek his will. You need to hear from heaven. And you need to be baptized with a power that you don't have. Can I tell you, their counsel worked. Yeah. Their counsel made me better than I could have been without him. Amen. I don't need to 
to talk about politics or, or, or cultural things when I'm with my family. I'd rather talk about the one who saved my soul and has made a difference in my family. That's the way of Christ. I want you blameless and harmless. I want you children of God without fault. Paul, did you have to tell me so much I have to do? This is the answer. No, don't like it. Most of us don't. Most of us hear this and we'd rather fix other people. I don't want to fix me. But God wants to fix you. God says you are my answer. You are who I want to use. We try to pass him off to somebody else when he's knocking on our door and saying, let me use you. Blameless, harmless, without fault. There is a reason behind this. If something is crooked or perverse, how can you know how to fix it? You know how to fix it by seeing what works. If you got, if you got a, a bit piece of, of your automobile, something that's been wrecked, something that's been broken. I, I recently had a, a, a motor map that was broken. Well, how do you fix that? We don't have to set up a council and say, okay, what do we do? I don't know what to do. Look, I'll get back to you in a few days and I'll tell you what, what I think we ought to do. No, you go to the store that's got another one that's already been engineered. It's already been manufactured. It will work perfectly. You take what is broken, you replace it with what works, and guess what? It sure did. So Christ is the answer for all of your problems. Christ is the solution for all of your longings, all of your desires, all of your incompleteness. So I don't have to re-engineer the wheel. I can just tell every one of you, get more of Jesus and let Him have more of you and you will stand out like a light in the middle of the darkness because this is a crooked and perverse generation. Don't look like them. Look like something that works. Let's stop abuse inside the church. Let's stop marriages failing in the church. Let's stop children being abused in the church. Let's do what's right within the church. Let's quit trying to fix a world that is wrong and let's start with the church and then work our way out. Jesus said it. Jesus said it clearly. He doesn't mind you taking the, the, the splinter out of somebody else's house. He don't mind that. Just make sure you get that log out of yours first. Work on you. And then you will know how clearly to help those around you. This is his solution. He says, I want you to be this so that you will shine like lights in the world. This is not, well, I'm just bragging I'm better than you. This is not, look at me. No, 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 this is not that. Shining as lights in the darkness. I have another story for you. It comes from the 1500s as well. Martin Luther came out about this time. Not a perfect man by any means. Who hasn't been perfect? But he said, I know the scriptures and something's wrong here. Church, you're wrong. I have some problems with the way you're doing things. He says, I think we need to just listen to scripture and nothing else. I don't, I don't think we need to listen to tradition anymore or what the popes and the bishops say. I say, what does the word of God say? And let's just stand on that. Radical. Radical thing for him to say. But he said, also, I think we ought to believe that, you know, we're not really saved by work, so forget all the indulgences, forget all the pilgrimages. We just need to believe in Jesus. Mmm. That got under the government's skin as well. The church's skin, the same thing. Uh, that, that definitely bothered them tremendously because he was saying that. But he also said, he wasn't finished. He says, I think we should also realize that our faith is not enough. It takes grace. If we don't have grace, we have nothing. So he's gotten to the point, only scripture, only grace, and only faith. And then he says there's only one work that will do it. It's only Christ. Amen. Now we, we, are, we, are, we say those things and you say, well, duh, preacher, I know all those things. You're in the 21st century. This was the 1500s. Where the government and the church had merged and they were God to this world. And Martin Luther had the audacity to say, well, no, you're not. Other reformers said, mm, no, you're not. You're not God. You're not. And they fought him. And of course, that's another story for another day. But he just didn't fight the political battle. That's, that's the point I want to make. He made treatises. He nailed those 95 theses and he had to run for the rest of his life because he did that. But in his own home, 
in his own home, he lived what he believed. Instead of beating himself on the back, and instead of crawling to Rome on his knees, he took Jesus as his Savior alone by faith through grace and something transformed in his heart. And he began to do things that weren't sanctioned by the church and the government, but they were sanctioned by Almighty God. You've done some of that today. He says, you know what? We ought to not just tell the gospel. We ought to sing the gospel. We ought to sing about how great he's done. And so he started singing these things called Christmas carols. Amen. Not as a little ditty to make you snap your fingers and say, ooh, I really like that that time. No. He says we ought to put our belief system in the midst of the song because they can't read. The priest won't let them hand to the Bible. They don't know Latin. They need to know the glorious gospel of Jesus that he sent. God sent his son into the world. And so he wrote hymns. One of the ones I like, horrible to play, so Leah says, <laughs> So, if you want to do it, you can sing it solo by yourself. And I can understand, it's not easy. But he also wrote this Christmas carol. From heaven above to earth I come. From heaven above to earth I come to bear good news to every home. Glad tidings of great joy I bring. Whereof I now will say and sing to you this night is born a child of Mary, chosen, virgin, mild. This little child of lowly birth shall be the joy of all the earth. Amen. That's Amen. theology in, in song. And the church hated it. How dare you sing these songs? Got to run for his life again. He was doing that. He was doing that a lot. But it started with his children. It started in his home. Another tradition that you take for granted that he helped popularize. He was walking through the woods one dark night, going from, from, from the village back to his own home. And as he went through the forest, he looked through the evergreens around him. And he saw stars everywhere. Like the other night, Brother Tony, we just walk out of church and just, wow, look at them. I mean, they're just, wow. And he said, I want my children to see this in their home and know that the heavens declare the glory. So the evergreen tree that they brought into their house, he put candles on that tree. I don't recommend that. Watch that thing. That thing will burn. But Tommy says, don't, don't do that. <laughs> so don't do that. But that's what he did. He put lights on it because he said, I want you to see the light of the world. I want you to know the glories of Jesus. When, I, when you see the presence come under that tree, I want you to know an evergreen Savior. Man, that was a good sermon. Somebody ought to preach that. He had it first, so <clears throat> try it. I'm, I'm, I'm a few hundred years too late. But I want you to see Jesus. See, it wasn't about kids yelling, what can I get, what can I get? It wasn't about, okay, did I do enough to be a good parent this year? He said, this season, we ought to celebrate Jesus. We ought to lift Him up. And that's radical in His time. Can I tell you? It's pretty radical for today too. That Jesus is the most important thing during the season. And not all the stuff that we've added to it. Still pretty radical. And so I look at this tree today. Isn't it sad? <laughs> oh, it's got a lot of nice, nice stuff on it. But it's missing something, isn't it? It's missing something. How about we add something to it? One simple thing. Does it make a difference? Church, does it make a difference? I want to hear you this morning. Does it make a difference? The light of the world makes all the difference. What did he say? I want you to be blameless and I want you to be faultless. I want you to be children of God because I want you to shine like lights in the world. And I like Martin Luther. Start at home. Start with your family. Start with your community. Start with the person you work with. Yes, they're grouchy. Yes, they're evil, but they don't know Jesus. Feel sorry for them. When they give you grief, just say, I love you in Jesus' name. Because that's going to do two things. You're going to feel better, and you're going to tick them off even more. 
Probably a bad reason. I probably shouldn't advise that one either. But the Bible says do good to those who don't do good to you. You see, this is Jesus' solution. Let them be darker. The dark, hallelujah, the darker they act, the brighter your actions will shine. Let them be heathen. You'll show yourself, I'm not a fellow heathen. I'm somebody different. Who makes you different? The light of the world. See those stars that Luther saw so many years ago through those evergreen pines. You see, they are just constant lights. Even though right now you can't see them, they're still there. They haven't gone anywhere. It's just the sun is so bright, you can't see them. But come nighttime, you look up. They're there. But those are not just lights sticking out there. They're suns like we have in our solar system. You know that? The reason we see the light is because of that great power that is inside of them. It is so potent, you can see it so many trillions of miles away, perhaps. You still see the light. I think God has a message in there. What, hallelujah, what goes on inside of you ought to be so potent and powerful that it is seen everywhere you go. It will offend some people. I'm sure stars out there offend somebody out there because Lord knows we love to be offended. But I think there's still some people that look for a piece of hope. A little light in this dark Because even in the midst of all these smiles from a privileged generation, there's some broken hearts, Amen. broken Amen. families, Amen. broken people. Yes. This is not working. They'll, they'll say it does because they don't want to show a bad face, but it's not working on the inside. This generation is mentally ill. The younger generation is, is one of the most greatest mentally ill generations we've ever seen. That's a problem. That's a problem. So, so if that means the case, it's going to continue. The homelessness is going to continue. The, 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 the suicides are going to continue. The broken families are going to continue. The children are going to continue to be used and abused. That's a problem. Where's the hope? That is exactly what the world is crying out for, even if they don't know it. Where are the lights? Where are they? Not the ones screaming at the top of their lungs. The ones like the stars. He didn't say, I want you, like a, like a sun blazing in all your glory. Jesus is coming. He doesn't need you. <laughs> Literally, when he shows up, everybody's going to know it. But he says, I want you to shine. And that's, that's the text behind the Greek. It's, it's, it's to be brilliant like a star. So just constant, steady light. We say that's boring. But then they catch me. And I just want to stand and I just want to watch and watch and watch. That's nothing but balls of gas. You are people that's been created in the image of God. The Holy Spirit has come in to reside in you. You are a light. So be a light in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And if you say a word, notice his language in verse 16. I'm closing with this. Hold fast. That means you know the truth. Hold it. Hold it. Don't let it go yourself. And don't forget to share it. This is the truth. I can't make you believe it. I won't force you to believe it. But that's the truth. Hold fast. Fast the word of life. But I need to prove it and I need to argue. No, no, no. Second verse. Do this without grumbling. Do this without complaining. Your grumbling and complaining is going to convert nobody. But if you hold it out, hold it out. He is, hallelujah, he's enough. Wasn't he for you? Wasn't he for you? He was enough for me. I don't, I, I, I've heard plenty of preachers shout at me. I've heard them. I've heard them. But that's never moved me to salvation. What moved me to salvation was a quiet Sunday school teacher who said, do you want Jesus in your heart and life? And it was more than her words. It was something in my heart that said, I want him who you're offering. It's not about the presentation. It's about the quality of who you're 
you're sharing. And can I tell you, Jesus is more than all the world. He is of infinite better quality than anything else you can ever share. So hold fast the word of life. I have failed to do something. I was going to do something. I didn't do it. I'm going to start today. On our Facebook page, I'm going to start listing how I'm seeing Jesus' this holiday season. I told you I'll do that too. I won't have a show of hands whether you listen to your pastor or not. I'm just praying God can think to him. No, what I'm praying, I want you to look for him. I saw this season start Walked in Walmart. It's probably not a good way to start your season. Because I see Halloween. And I see some Thanksgiving spices. And I see some Christmas ones. That is a mess. That is just an absolute mess. But all they are are retailers. What did I expect of them? I expect the spirit of Christmas at Walmart? Really? Really? Hmm. No. They just sell it. They don't own it. The way to start to see Christmas is to look for Jesus. Amen. He's right around you. So can I tell you what I have seen so far? And I, if I, when I share these on Facebook, you don't have to share until I share. But when I start sharing, I want you to share with me. Put it on the Facebook page. Here's where I've seen Jesus. You don't have to explain it. This is just what God's doing in you. But I can I tell you, I saw Jesus when I was packing some Operation Christmas Child packages. I saw him. In a Denver conversation at the Blue Ocean, in that conversation, I saw Jesus. In the beautiful red flowing down the Christmas tree, the blood has never lost its power. And I see Jesus. In a beautiful new song that I've heard about Christmas, I saw Jesus. In helping to bless a veteran, I saw Jesus. In picking up acorns along the walk, I saw the life giver. I saw my Jesus. In the story of a cancer survivor who is living according to God's plan, I saw Jesus. You want to know him? This thing's Ricky Deal. You won't forget the interaction. I promise you will not. But I saw Jesus. In the weight of his glory that I've seen in Scripture. Just this past Wednesday night, I see Jesus. In a need that I had, that I thought the worst, but God said it's not that bad at all. I see Jesus. In remembering a former pastor's of mine, loving heart, that I'm only now realizing the depths of the things that he shared with me, I see Jesus. And the child smile so often these past few days. I see Jesus. He's everywhere. I'm not just looking for good things. I'm looking for things that speak to me of Him. You know what? My life is far from empty and devoid of Him. I'm seeing Him. But you know how it's coming? I'm looking. When I look, I find. When I'm not looking, somehow He doesn't slap me across the face. And say, Here I am. Here I am. Pay attention to me. You seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. If I want to be a light, it's time to go to the light of the world. If I want to hold fast, it's to the one that held fast to his dying breath. If I want to stand for truth, then I need to go to the way, the truth, and the life. If I find him, I will be transformed by the interaction. And you, you can be the same when you stand Can I say to you, I want you to have a so blessed Christmas. And I want it to start now because I know some of you are starting to get together as family. Some of you are starting to, um, to um, do activities together. It's wonderful. Hallelujah. Great. Spend less, time, spend less time shopping and spend more time loving on each other. Whatever that works. Do it. Do it. It's great. We need each other. God gave us each other. But I want Jesus to be the centerpiece. I, I'm, I'm so proud of so many families in our church. And I, 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 I say that, and I truly, I truly mean that. But I, I spent some time both with Jacob and Amanda's family. And I was talking to the 
to the ones above them, because I'm proud of these kids, but they didn't, they didn't pop out of the ground. They, they came out of a family. Talk to some of that family. Grandpa, in fact, <laughs> every year we're going to share the Christmas story. Every year. going to happen. He's 80... 83. That's a long time. That's a lot longer than I've been alive, but the Christmas story is that important. And I saw the fire in his eye. Though it's not like it's stopping this year either. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Jesus is going to be the same. Can I tell you, that makes a difference. It makes a difference in your family. I was, I was, talking, to, I was talking to Jacob's mom and dad, and I tried to say, man, how good a job. No, no, no. They just wouldn't agree with me. I'm trying to give a couple. They wouldn't. Now, we had hell. And I'm sure the elder birds would say the same. It's not just us. So did dad finally come in? No. I love what he said. He said we had a lot of help from family. I love that. That means you're important. You come to the gathering and say, oh, well, I'm getting together. No, no. You are important. If you're in attendance, you're bringing light into that place. If you choose to, you choose to ignore it, you choose to make it about something else. But can I tell you, he wants you to shine his lights. Brilliant. Probably somebody in that family that needs you. Can I tell you, I've sat down with my family many times. And I said, God, touch them, God, touch them, God, touch them. Because they're messed up. They know what drug addiction is like. They know what broken homes are like. They know it. And I mourn looking at their lives. But can I tell you, God, who knows how to mend, He knows how to bring together, He knows how to create light where there is none. And there's more people celebrating the name of Jesus than I have ever seen before in my family. And I say, thanks be to God. Shining the light makes a difference. And you can too. Don't ever give away your inheritance for something less than the bubbles of this world. Because God has done something in you that makes a difference. And don't you ever let that devil tell you anything less. So I want you to bow your heads and I want you to pray with me. If you need Jesus, get yourself down to this altar and get, right, get on the right path and go on with it today. We don't have time to play around. It's just time to be who we're going to be. And Jesus would say, if you're going to be darkness, just go ahead and be darkness. Go ahead. Keep following that road. But if you're going to be light, be light. Don't put it off for a New Year's resolution. How about today? Today. Take it home. Take it in your conversations. When you're at work, take it. I don't, I don't like to often share about my, my wife. Well, I do. Okay. Not always. But she works with a lot of people now that don't know Jesus. That's different for her. It's a struggle sometimes. But in our conversations, I see Jesus is working. They sometimes act like sinners. She's tried to act like Christ. They like talking to her. They miss her when she's not there. Now, my wife is a wonderful worker. She's got a lot of good things. But I think if she didn't have that character she brought, I don't think it would make that impact. You see, here's the thing I believe, because I've seen it too. Jesus is stronger than sin. Just being around you don't assure their salvation, but it sure don't hurt. And in fact, it can plant seeds that last for a lifetime. I know that's what Lee is doing, and I believe that's what you're doing too. So shine. Let's pray for that light to shine accurately from us. Pray that God start in me that what comes out of me is just pure pure light. And if you're going to share, if you're going to open your mouth, let it be the truth. Let it be the holding forth the word of truth. Father, I just pray for this congregation. I pray for a special spiritual emphasis in our hearts today. That God, as we look at the season, I know we probably got shopping. I know we've got cooking to do. God, I want it to be something greater than that, though. I want there to be human interaction. I want there to be human blessing. I want there to be to be verbal and, and, and activities, actions, dear God. I just saw it as you gave me an opportunity to bless a veteran, dear God. That ministered to me. And I, it was seen. And it was seen. And God, I thank you for that. We don't know the, the, the opportunities we have unless we allow you to work. 
God, I pray that you will truly bless them when they talk to their family, when they talk to their friends, when they have these interactions during the season. May they treasure those. Even if it's not in an uncomfortable environment, it's not their favorite, but God, let them understand they are on mission. They have been sent from God to that place at that moment and what they can do, oh God, let them do. If nothing else, they can be the light that you want them to be. And Father, I just pray for blessing on all those around them. God, I pray for some of these cancers that we've heard. I pray they be healed in Jesus' name around us. I pray that the circumstances, the evil that's going on around us because evil doesn't take holidays. Dear God, I pray it would be dissipated and things will change in this time. It's Christmas season. But God, I pray more than all those things that the way these precious people of yours live will make an impact of light. Just like this Christmas tree shines so beautifully here in the sanctuary, may they shine like you wherever they go, whatever they do, all to the praise and glory of your name. Because God, they are the difference makers. And I pray they see it for themselves. Father, we honor you today and give you thanks and glory for these and all your blessings. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's just finish this song out with Brother Jimmy. He's all I need. Just pray it to him in song.